Medium wave signal, please proceed. Yes, our scanners have detected a powerful transmission of interplanetary hit music. The signal originates from the waters near the Earth landmass Europa. The music on the channel never stops for more than a minute. And what do the Earthlings call this transmission? Laser 558, all hit radio. And how would you characterize this hit music on Laser 558? It has got the beat. The council approves. I now appoint you as messenger. Nad, you must inform all outposts that they are to listen to Laser 558. Yes, your Supreme Galactica. Soon everyone will be listening to Laser 558. We're talking with a guy who can a little bit of Netherlands, Paul Paul Alexander Rusling. Yeah. <laughs> Remembering uh, we met the first time in 1973, in the early 73. Uh, Nokken, jonge, 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 yeah? Mm -hmm. Ten years old? Mm. Um, maybe 20. <laughs> yeah, 17, yeah. 17 years old. I uh, been a friend of Chris Carey. Um, they work um, at Radio Caroline and Radio Nordsea, you know. Um, van ja 68. En ik arbeid in de clubs in Tiffany's in Schevningen, op de pier in Schevningen, als disc jockey. En ik arbeid ook in Engeland in vele clubs en um, grote pubs als disc jockey in Londen, in, in Noord-Engeland, Noord-Oost-Engeland, in Yorkshire. En Chris Carey zegt, um, we willen een disc jockey op Radio Caroline, of veel disc jockey op Radio Caroline, uh, Roscoe of Tony Prince, um, and New York Bengals, very, very fast delivery disc jockeys for a, a, a rock and roll in Radio Caroline International with a rock and roll atmosphere for 1973. But, uh, so, so I joined Radio Caroline for the test transmissions on uh, 389, 300 Nikon and Tactic Meter, yeah. And um, Ronan said, um, I will LA up the radio here. <laughs> and he wanted to play hard rock and roll, the Eagles and Linda Ronstadt and Carly Simon, and, and maybe laid back rock. And me, Chris Carey, and Chicago, we wanted to play. Eddie Cochran and maybe the Tremolos and um, the Swinging Soul Machine from The Hague, who are very good friends of ours. And especially Shocking Blue with Mariska Veris. Why? <laughs> because she came from Scheveningen? Um, yeah, because she came from Scheveningen and also because she was very, very beautiful. Even more beautiful in Holland than Hans Verbaan. At that time. <laughs> at that time, yes. And um, so Caroline 389 became a half a rock and roll station and half a run and laid back station and the station didn't really work there was no money in Caroline and I always say you need two things to make a successful offshore station you need lots and lots of money and you need good people who have experience on the sea and Caroline had the experience on the sea but no money so Caroline had to go to people with money who were from Belgium because the people in Holland were then tied up with Radio Veronica and Radio Nordsee and the only friends Caroline really had were um, a lady who ran the Boom Boom disc, uh, Boom Boom Boutique in Den Haag and by that time we'd had some argument I think with Gerard Van Damme he wouldn't play ball with Caroline any longer and we brought over a guy called Terry Bates who is one of the best advertising people Radio Caroline from ever From Canada I came. From Canada that's right now running around, he, Terry Bates came to England in the mid 60s Running a rally and Radio Caroline paid uh, millions of pounds, maybe, well, not millions, but thousands of pounds, to hire Terry Bate to counteract Radio London, which was taking all the advertising. And Terry Bate had all the good advertising ideas from Canada. And he was put under a seven year contract in 1966. 
Now, in 68, as we all know, Caroline was um, towed away by the Weismuller brothers into Amsterdam for some mistakes a lot of people made. And when Caroline came back in 72, 73, Terry Bate was still officially under contract to Caroline. I know, yeah. So he came back and worked with Radio Caroline for the first two or three months I was there. In early 1973, we had Terry Bate, and he went around Holland and he got people like Stam Auto Rental. Um, and some very other big advertisers in Holland and they were prepared to put money into Caroline if Caroline could put out pop music international service on 389 with an audience in England and in Holland and in Belgium maybe and also fill the hole in the market which North Sea and Veronica were chasing the pop music fans under 25 so Caroline on Caroline the 259 service Radio Caroline we said we would chase the sweet music fans, people who wanted to listen to Frank Sinatra, Peggy Lee and so on, and Andy Archer was in charge of this format with uh, disc jockeys such as Leo Delata, who uh, later went on to big things oh, yeah. with Radio Veronica and Hilversum also, and still works for the, I think, the ANP in Holland. I is now working for uh, Met It Over Morgen, the actuality program. Really? Yeah. He is an excellent journalist, and even then he was very, very young. I think he was only 17, was Leo, and uh, Radio Veronica, they tried to poach him from us while he was still working for Caroline, and we had him for, I think, two months. And he, would, he you could tell then I was an Englishman and I was a very young, really a disc jockey, although now I'm a journalist, but you can look back and see, and Leo and I have still kept in touch, and you could see he was a very, very good journalist and bound to go on to big things. I think he'll become to Holland eventually, will Leo, what maybe Reginald Bosenket or Angela Rippon is in England eventually. Mm -hmm. After Caroline, uh, it was a little bit quiet in the surroundings of Paul Alexander Rushling. In, in, in the years before you went on in the 70s, uh, what did you do? All that? Well, I went back to England. Um, when Caroline went off the air, we, we closed down with a generator breakdown. What happened was I was the on... The first or the 21st? Yeah, uh, maybe the 21st or 221st hands. I came back on board the ship with Chris Carey, Andy Archer, Chris Carey's wife Kate and myself. We went back on a tender and Steve England's program was six till nine in the evening and I took over at seven o'clock I think and it's very very funny the story that happened because we always had problems with generators on Caroline you got one piece of equipment working the aerial and then something else would fill mm -hmm. and that generator had been giving us problems for weeks and um, what happened was I took over the program from Steve and I said okay and now this is Caroline International back on 389 and if you don't believe me listen to this and I turned to a small reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder a very old domestic one we had in the studio and it was um, a Tandberg from Germany and I turned it on and it was an old Caroline going back in time David Lee Travis jingle going back in time and the sounds and the it's a Caroline flashback and then I went into a record the Supremes are happening and at this time I didn't notice first maybe I'd had a drink I don't know and uh, Kate Carey was standing there, and Chris Carey there, and Andy Archer there, and, and they were watching this, this, this super fast delivery we were into in those days. And they said, oh, the lights are going, the record's slowing down. And <coughs> I said, oh, that bloody... <coughs> some very, very dirty words in English. Other generators let us down again. And, and Chris said, oh, that went out in the air, Ronan will strangle you when you go back to London. And, you know, I shook in my boots for three weeks. Didn't go back to London and see Ronan because I thought he heard me swearing over Caroline International and the generator, which I had called names for weeks, had saved me because the generator cut out. As soon as I said, if you don't believe me, listen to this, click, the generator stopped, the transmitter clicked out and we had dead air on 389. And 389 has never come back on the air. It's been BBC local radio ever since in this country, which is very sad for England and Holland. Then we go over to the early 70s. Suddenly there are starting rumors that a guy who, were, who was on Radio Caroline in the 70s, in the 60s, was related to a new project which would be starting uh, and financed by American backers. Yes, what happened was, <coughs> excuse me, I went back in and worked in, um, in nightclubs and so on, and then I took a couple of public houses with my wife in London. And uh, I was still very, very interested in radio. You see, I became in, I, I was dragged into radio by Chris Carey as a disc jockey. I guess I did that style of delivery he wanted in clubs. And, and I was always a radio anorak from 1966 or 67. And um, in 1982, a very rich Irishman wanted his own radio station because his girlfriend said it would make him a big star. And he approached a disc jockey he knew and a chap from the BBC he knew down at a, a resort called Les Arc in Switzerland or in, in southern France very close to the Swiss border 
And um, they said, yes, we will build you a radio station. So he was a guy who knew nothing about radio. He said, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for the radio station. You from the BBC, and you are a disc jockey. You know all about radio, the pair of you. Go and build a radio station. So they went to Broadcast Magazine. Now, a young lady worked there at the time called Gabrielle Drake, and she said, oh, Paul Rustling, I talked to him on the telephone. He knows all about radio ships. He was a radio engineer because he worked on, I worked on tugs. I trained as a radio engineer, a ship's radio operator in, in the early 70s. And um, he will tell you better about radio. And these guys came to me, uh, John Kenning in particular, and said, we want to build a radio station for our very rich friend. He can put as much money in it as possible. So I said, well, you don't need as much money. Look, there is a hole in the market now in England for a top 40 station. Radio 1 is for children, not for teenagers even, but for children up to 12 years old. From 12 to 30, there is no radio station for record buyers. Record companies, I know, will pay a lot of money if there is a radio station on that is nothing more than a jukebox, just playing non-stop top 40. My own personal idea was Radio England and Radio Dolphin and Radio Tevete Sevo was the best formatted radio station. No, I don't think Radio Dolphin was best format. OK, but it, they did play music very fast because the Dutch disc jockeys such as Lex Harding who is still now a, a caller. Like Den Hengst then that day. Yeah, I don't remember him uh -huh. but I do know who you mean. And um, they, to me, epitomised as the English word. I don't know the Dutch word but they were the cornerstone of something in England that I knew would happen eventually where American disc jockeys talk fast. Nobody wants a disc jockey. Disc jockeys are big ego trippers. I know I was a disc jockey for eight years, full time. They want to be, the disc jockey wants to be the star. The listeners don't want the disc jockey as a star. They want to hear the music. So the music's got to keep coming back to back, music all the way, and the disc jockey should put the words in where he can make them fit. Now, I had this idea, and I said to Kenning, I said, this is the idea you've got to do. English disc jockeys, there's only maybe three or four in the whole country that know this idea. Go to America, there are dozens and dozens of good disc jockeys. I used to take all my holidays in the States, I knew people over there. I could pick disc jockeys like that, that would do it, although they wouldn't come and work for this radio station then. And John Kenning and I, we, I, I said, but the, <coughs> going back, the, the thing is, a radio station such as this has got to have some money. Nobody just pumps money into a radio ship. There's got to be some money coming back out for the guy who put the money in. And some money coming out to pay the crew. So I said, there must be good advertising. It's illegal for advertising now in Holland, in Belgium, France, everywhere but Spain. There's not enough advertising from Spain, if there's any at all. You must go to the States, or Japan, or South Africa for advertising. So we saw a guy who I'd spoke to called Roy Lindau. Now, I thought Roy Lindau was the best advertising guy in New York. He was the only advertising guy I knew. I knew maybe three advertising guys. Roy was the best. He wasn't the best advertising guy of all the rest, though. Um, so I took Kenning to New York. We said, here's Roy Lindau. He can sell the radio station to the advertisers. You need income. And Roy endorsed my comments. He said, yes, Paul Rustling is right. We will make 17 million US dollars every year from a top 40 radio station covering England, southern England, Holland and Belgium. So we then went down to Florida um, to uh, the brother-in-law of uh, a friend of mine who had a transmitter factory called CSI and he said, I will do you a good deal. I have no transmitters at all in Europe. I want to sell transmitters in Europe. I will sell you these transmitters cheap. After that, <coughs> I left the project to them. That was my work over. Mm -hmm. I was only in Anorak. I wasn't involved in offshore radio. And I left it. And then some months later, I had a telephone call from Philip Smith, who was the owner of Laser, who was this mysterious millionaire in Ireland, pumping all the money and say, he said, well, um, things aren't going right. We don't, John Kenning doesn't know enough about radio for me. Um, Maybe not enough of offshore radio. Not enough of offshore radio, yeah. John was a nice guy, very nice guy, but he didn't pay all his bills as quickly as I'd have liked. And I believe in this. I believe if a man does a job, he should be paid for the job. No more, but no less. And so John and I fell out on this matter um, because it's a history in offshore radio where people work in the offshore stations and then they don't get all the money. And people say, well, we can give him maybe 50 pounds or 100, 200 guilders and he'll be happy. Sure, the guy will be happy, but he won't come back and work again. So you train that guy, you give him four weeks work on, on the radio ship, make him a good disc jockey, the listeners like him, he doesn't come back. They start again with a new guy. And that to me is wrong. You should pay good disc jockeys. But we, we, we got laser... Um, eventually I, I was 
enticed back into the laser organisation and I went to the States. <coughs> By this time, Roy Lindau had brought in two other people, an Englishman called Paul Hodge, who was involved in refloating Radio Caroline's Ross Revenge in 1981. Um, then also came up a chap called Len Muller. Now, Len had a lot of business contacts and he was a very nice guy, a good business guy, who knew all about business in New York and could get as many advertising contracts as Laser could handle with two stations, not one. Laser was going to be two stations. It was going to be called Radio Star and Radio Waves. Radio Star would be a top 40 station for the young kids. Radio Waves would be a, a yuppie station for 25 to 45 year olds with golden oldies from the 70s and 60s. Now, they also had some different ideas. Down in Florida, there's a Coast Guard station which looks out for drugs traffickers on the radar with a balloon suspended 1,200 feet above the Florida Keys. And I've been down there and seen it. It's got a generator in the sky hanging under this balloon and radar transmitters and they can see 300 miles across the Caribbean and out to the Bahamas so they can catch all the drug smugglers. And Len Muller was with me when we saw this and he said this is a great way to hold an aerial. If we could hold that aerial up there in Europe, it would be a great so I said, well, yeah, if you could get a balloon as big as that, but look at the size of the balloon. It's four times the size of the ship. So I said, oh, that's okay, we'll get a smaller balloon. I said, it won't work. But he said, it will work, we'll make it work, we get more helium in the balloon. So I said, yeah, okay, I don't believe you, but the people in, um, in South Dakota, where Brandy Lee comes from, incidentally, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, are called Raven Industries, and they sell these balloons, and of course they were keen to sell some balloons to Laser, and they said, oh yes, no problem, we'll make a balloon stay up there, 400 feet high, so I said, good, 400 feet high aerial, you'll make it work, it's a good deal, but let's take a small mast with us, in case it doesn't work. They well, agreed with that, that uh, <laughs> an aerial mast can? We were going to have two stations, two transmitters each, two 25 CSI transmitters, and then two 25 CSI transmitters, one combiner into the aerial. So you have two stations. If one transmitter fails, instead of 50 kilowatts, you have 25 kilowatts for that station. Now, <coughs> excuse me. What happened was, we had twin generators, and we started running out of money. There was a, a lot of money. What happened was, the, the shipyard took a long time. They spent a lot of money on doing the ship up. Roy opened a big, big office in the Panam building in New York, and then we couldn't afford the Panam building, so we had to go around onto Madison Avenue, to 341 Madison Avenue. And we were all the time cutting the money. Save $10,000 here, save $10,000 there. Same problem so, with many other radio stations. Yeah, this is it. Enough money, the right experience. What happened was, cut one generator. That, to my mind, should have been the last cut. Mm -hmm. But we cut the generator, then we cut the second service. Then CSI said, we'll pay for the second service, we believe in this, we'll stick half a million dollars in. Then more money was spent, there were advertising trips for potential advertisers, and they were to go out to Las Vegas and have a great week at Laser's expense. And here I'm talking about advertisers, Marlboro Cigarettes, Philip Morris and Company were involved. They had discussions, they issued a letter of intent saying, we will advertise on this radio station, we will pay two million dollars within one year. AC Delco said, we will advertise all our spare parts for um, General Motors Group in Europe, for Opel and for Vauxhall Motors in Britain. And then we got the coup. We got a company which would be so big it would make offshore radio work, and that was the Ford Motor Corporation. Now, Ford are so big, they don't care what the British government feel. They don't care what the American government feel. Ford were going to come on, and they were going to launch a range of cars called Laser. And the station was going to be called Laser to promote those cars. And you've probably all seen in England now we have some cars going around called Laser. Not so many because the advertising campaign was turned down. I when, remember when, one when day on... Overran. I remember one day on the Afsluitdijk seeing a Laser Ford with a sticker Laser on it. That's probably right. And that was probably one of the Ford motor people's. Ford in Britain were very, very disappointed that the Laser was not tied in with their launch of the Laser range because they'd been promised by the people in Detroit the original Ford people who we originally arranged laser with, laser radio with, that the whole thing would go together and work. But they didn't allow for things like North Sea weather, silly balloon ideas, and other things that didn't work, and shipyards holding us up. Then what happened was a ship sailed out and came off the English coast, and as you know, the balloons didn't work. Marlborough pulled out, Ford pulled out, and AC Delco went ev eventually as well, although there was some friction between Ford and AC Delco. But then... Um, the DTI started sniffing around because this thing had taken too long and the original deal was I would only be involved until the ship left the States. I stayed on after the ship left the States and made that terrible mistake. 
and uh, because the station had no organisation. Paul Hodge had dual British and American nationality and should have been in charge of arranging the supplies to Spain. He'd gone by the wayside and been some argument over money again. A long, long story of offshore radio. People argue over the money. So they had no one in England at all, so there was myself, and I involved a couple of other English people who were probably well known to the free radio world and their ships. And um, we began with an ILR engineer designing an aerial in England, then he said, we'll build it in England and fly it out by helicopter. Well, at the time I was a publican, I had a bar license in England, in Kent. I didn't want to lose my license, so I said, I can't carry on with this. I had the DTI turn up with three of them and two policemen at my public house one day. Fortunately, my manager, who was living at the pub, looks like me, and they said to him, oh, can we have a word in private upstairs? And he took them upstairs and they said, can we have a look around? And I had a look around, and they said, no papers for lasers. So they said, oh, someone said you, Paul Rustling, were involved in this radio ship. It's not true, is it? He said, I'm not involved in a radio ship. And I was sitting six miles away in my bungalow at Hearn Bay, talking to the ship at that time. He was talking to them. <laughs> but then I said, no, this is too much. With people in England, someone's going to be arrested and it isn't going to be Paul Rustling. Mm -hmm. I'm out, and I flew to Dublin the same day, and I saw Philip Smith and said, I don't want to be involved, I'm going to do it, but we'll do this a different way. I can't be involved in this any longer. And I left the project on April the 4th in 1984, as far as I'm concerned. It's odd that a month later, Roy Lindau issued a report, a press release saying that he'd never heard of Paul Rustling, or Paul Hodge, or John Kenning, or anyone else that had been involved. He helped us out a great deal. Thank you, Roy. Good. Then you uh, came back to Holland several times, and uh, I heard there were some troubles with a guy called Tom de Munk. Yeah, Tom de Munk's been around the radio scene a long, long time, and I'm sure he's as much an anorak as I am and very, very keen on radio stations. Unfortunately, Tom works for a magazine which demands a story every month, it would seem. And when Tom hasn't got a story, he makes one up. He made one up some years ago that I was a partner of uh, Crispian St. John, who is a well-known name in, in radio circles. Mm, Crispian, or Howard Rose, uh, his real name is here today, and he will say, I was not involved with him. We never went to Holland ourselves. We never had any deals with radio ship people. And uh, we were never buying a ship in Holland. I was involved at the time in with uh, some people from Scotland who had promises of a million dollars from an American bank to float a, a radio station off England and we said you don't need a million dollars you need less than 200,000 pounds sterling um, he didn't have the wherewithal to put you had to put up a deposit to get this loan it was a strange American very very shady bank deal so I had 15,000 pounds sterling or 30,000 dollars that I could take to the States and arrange this million dollar loan which would put his station on the air and another project we have for commercial offshore radio pop radio in Scandinavia now Denmark, Sweden, Norway and Finland to some extent have no commercial broadcasting, no pop radio. We thought we can make a lot of money in Scandinavia and I'm, I'm still certain we can. You put Nowadays local radio is uh, very popular in Denmark. But local radio is talk, 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 bit of bingo, a bit more talk and not very much music. And we all know what the people want to hear on the radio. Music! <laughs> so we thought that would work in Scandinavia. I saw a script with uh, Tom de Munk, going back to that. Mm -hmm. has written but not published about very strange phone calls he got from you from a hotel in Rotterdam. Maybe you can tell your own story about that. Uh, there was a case where I, I was over in Rotterdam maybe um, oh, 18 months ago and I met with a very uh, famous Radio Money presenter and um, at the time I was involved in, I persuaded the owner of a ship in England that we, he could make some money from commercial radio, providing he had enough money to put into a project with a ship he owned called the Nanel, which is now quite famous in offshore radio circles because it's probably sat around as long as the Ross Revenge without doing anything. And unfortunately, we ran out of money on that project, and to bring some more money in, I thought the owner had a lot more money than he had, and I, I also was due to put in an amount of money, and I could only put in a very small proportion of the amount. I put in maybe £12,000 sterling, about 50,000 guilders maybe, or less. And we needed more money, so we interested um, a guy from Radio Monique who had a lot of contacts with record companies in Holland, and he was going to buy a second transmitter we had on that station and run a Dutch service from the ship, because the ship is a big ship, it's a 2,000 tonne ship. We, we put 1,100 tonnes of ballast in. I mean, I shoveled a lot of it in myself. I know how much ballast there is in that ship. It was a, a good ship to anchor in the middle of the North Sea for Holland and England. 
and I was across there with him and we were sat there and I'd come across on the Olau line and it was thick snow in Holland and we were at his house in uh, between The Hague and Rotterdam yeah and um, he didn't like Tom de Monk for some reason you never met him before. I'd, I'd never met Tom DeMont. I don't know. Tom yeah, DeMont you spoke with him, but yeah, Tom, Tom never met Ron. Yeah, Tom, Tom had written a silly story about me years ago, so I thought, well, Tom DeMont, you're crazy. And this guy said, oh, I don't like Tom DeMont. He's written silly stories about the Ross Revenge, and nobody likes him, but he tells daft stories. So, so I said, oh, okay, okay, we'll wind him up. We'll, we'll ask him to go to Rotterdam. And, and at the time, I had Blake Williams, who is a disc jockey Tom had never met, was in England staying in my house. And um, oh, we'd spoken to Rick Harris that morning. And in fact, I rang him from Ron West. Uh, delete that. I don't want to get Ron into trouble. <laughs> um, I, 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 I know Ron enough that he can laugh about the whole story after years. Okay. Well, I'd, I w we'd rang Rick Harris, I think, from uh, Ron's house, and and we said, okay, let's wind up Tom DeMonk. Tom DeMonk is always winding up his readers, saying, "New radio ship. Here is a trawler in Ireland, and it will be near Sh near Skavening next week." So we thought we'll wind Tom DeMonk up. We'll get him to go to Holland, and it was very thick snow in Holland. And Tom, De when we rang Tom, he said, "Oh, my car is not very well. I've only lights at one side, and I uh, can't drive to Rotterdam. All the police will get me." So I said, "Well, if you drive around all the back roads, around the polders and the canals, maybe you could drive." Oh yes, he said, "Good idea. I'll do that. It'll take me three hours." I said, "Okay. Well, we'll be there." <laughs> and uh, I think Tom de Monk maybe drove to Rotterdam. It was not a very good thing to do to Tom. Poor Tom. I feel sorry for Tom. He's, he's maybe very, very genuine in his free radio beliefs, but he should never, ever print a story. And I'm a journalist. I'm a member of the British Institute of Journalists. And you should never, ever print a story unless you can check the facts. And in offshore radio, the facts may be difficult to find, but never tell anyone else unless you know the facts. Hans, you're a journalist yourself. You know that. I can tell you that Tom was never has never been gone to Rotterdam. He oh. found the hotel and I'm find out that the number of the room you mentioned was not there. Oh well, that's because I was only in Holland at that time. I think for one day staying with Ron, and we were discussing a, a rental deal, which is nothing to do with Tom. Okay, over to another story. Then uh, you talked already about the Nanel. The latest uh, rumors there are talking about rumors that Paul Alexander Rustling is again involved in something. I'm always involved in something. I can't sit still. Um, I'm a radio listener. I'm a radio freak. Also a ship visitor. Well, I visit ships very frequently. I've been on three ships this week. Nothing to do with radio ships. I'm involved. I have um, a business with a friend of mine in the north of England. We're ship brokers. We sell ships. We buy ships and sell ships. Now, um, earlier this year, for instance, I was in Holland. I had um, some people who, um, with another business, who are well known to offshore radio people, we'd sell them a, a shortwave transmitter which is now on the air, that's KVOH. Mm -hmm. um, this is Transcom Corporation selling a transmitter to High Adventure Ministries. They run a, a radio station, some may regard it as a free radio station in southern Lebanon, which broadcasts Christianity, something I firmly believe in, into Israel, which needs Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, we, uh, one, the leader of High Adventure, George Otis, had a vision where the Lord appeared to him and said there should be a ship broadcasting to Asia called the Morning Star. And he approached my associate in the States and said, build me a radio ship. I don't care how much it costs, I don't care how long it takes, I want a radio ship to broadcast to Asia. Are you running out of tape? You can edit this, can't you? So, um, George flew over to London. We were going to then buy the commuter about three months before the owner of the communicator couldn't find a buyer for it in October 85, 86, when it was sat in the English port almost a year ago in Harwich. And um, the American religious people wanted to buy the ship for the Lord's purposes in Asia. And um, we gave them a price and they said, we'll think about it and raise the money. Well, it took them three months to raise the money. And when they came back in January, the communicator was on the air as laser hot hits. Mm -hmm. Now, I live in England some of the time, maybe one week a month, but I still live in England sometimes. And I like to hear laser hot hits, be it 576 or 5, whatever. I like to hear the station. And on, I think it was the 5th of February, George Otis arrived in England and said, I want to buy this ship. And I said, well, the owner doesn't want to sell. He's running laser hot hits. And the station is beginning to take off. Um, they are going to do well. It's going to be a big station again, bigger than last time, because they're going to have the ship run properly. It's going to get advertising. And he 
He said, well, if the Lord wants us to have that ship, he'll make it. Are there any other radio ships in Europe? And I said, well, there's only one, and it's been tied up in Holland in the Antwerp Haven since 1981 when it was arrested by the Dutch Reichspolitie or Royal Navy or whatever, or the BVD or whoever was involved. And um, it's called the Magda Maria, or maybe the Liev, and no one really knows its name. So we'll go and have a look. And I spoke to Ben Bird on the telephone. I've never met Ben Bird. Uh, we have a very good mutual. Alan West I've known since 1967. And Alan had met Ben several times. So we went across to Holland and looked over the um, Magda Maria. Ben didn't meet us down at the harbour. He didn't turn up in the morning. We had a TV film crew in Amsterdam standing by there. George Otis made a TV um, video for 15 minutes on the deck of the ship asking for support from Christians in the United States and other territories saying please send some money so that we can buy this ship and send it to do the Lord's work in Asia and spread Christianity. And we waited around until that tea time but Ben Bourne didn't turn up as he said he would. And uh, then I, when I did speak to him he was very irate and said I didn't approve you making a video on the deck of my ship. I don't want to sell the ship to you. I don't care if you offer me five million guilders. So I said, well, I'm sorry you take that attitude, Ben. If you do take a different attitude, call me. Because these people are willing to buy, and it's for a good cause. And they can definitely get the ship out of Holland. Because Holland, lots of people in politics in Holland are tied up with religion, as you know. And if the Dutch government were convinced the ship was going to spread religion on the far side of the world, they would let that ship go tomorrow. In fact, they'd probably give you a million guilders and fuel it up. So we left. And um, strangely enough, on the evening, we were sat in the... Um, in the hotel in Amsterdam, in the Pulitzer Hotel, and we sat saying, and, and we prayed that the Lord would find us a radio ship. And do you know, that was seven o'clock on the Tuesday evening, on January the 7th, 1987, and at that time, in about a four, seven or four, eight, not a bad storm in the North Sea, the masts on the communicator came down. And a week later, myself and a Panamanian shipping surveyor we brought up from Singapore went out to the communicator and we surveyed it. Um, for potential buying. We offered the owner of the communicator a uh, quarter of a million pounds sterling, I think it was, or thereabouts, very close to that figure. But he didn't want to sell because he was certain he could make laser hot hits pay. And uh, now a couple of months later, unfortunately, they've run out of money and it's still not paying. Who's got the money? That's what I want to know. <laughs> All uh, people behind the scene, um, sort of laser. Laser has a future. I, I think Let's refresh. Ask me what do I think about the future of the communicator? You can't use both those two transmitters together to their full potential with the aerial system on the communicator. So you've got to use them independently and make it two services. So I think the logical way to go forward, whoever runs a communicator, if they go the right way, they will put two stations on the air, not one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
Charlie Wolf. Thank, yes, I, I, luckily I'm here legally this time. Um, here is a visitor. It's, uh, it's not a permanent stay. I know a lot of friends came up and said, you're back, you're back. Uh, but it's just for a couple weeks. Came back for the drift back, which um, I felt was uh, very important that I be a part of uh, because not so much because of, of, of my involvement uh, or how I would fit into the history. Uh, I think actually that belongs more to the older guys that are here. But uh, just the, for the fact that it gives me a chance to see my audience and to tell them thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're working or living our days in the United States, do you think uh, with memories to this big period? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll never ever forget uh, my stay here. It was uh, by far the best radio I think I ever did. Uh, also, I made some very close friends here. I love this part of the world deeply. Um, my, my feet are killing me because the two weeks I've been here in London, uh, I almost refuse to take the tube anywhere. I'll even walk all the way across town just to see the buildings and the sites and what have you. Uh, so my feet are just, they're, they're dying. <laughs> but um, yeah, Laser gave me a chance to, to finally be me on the radio. So it's, it'll always hold very fond memories. What do you nowadays in the USA? Right now, I'm the commercial production director for a radio station, uh, radio station KFMY, which is in Salt Lake City. Actually, it's in a town called Provo, which is just south of Salt Lake. It's a suburban part of the, uh, of the city. And uh, I do an on-air shift on Sundays, but it doesn't really excite me much, because uh, I just go in and I go through the basics. Most of the time, I'm under a lot of pressure to get commercials produced, and we need these commercials by the next day, and nice people to work with, but I'd much rather be back on the air, and uh, especially back here, you know, where I feel I can do something. The station in Provo, was it the same station where you worked uh, earlier before you went to Laser? No, actually, I'd worked cross town from them. Uh, the station prior to Laser was a little teeny country station that's now automated. Um, but uh, these people, I was, I was quite fortunate. I, I got into town on Friday, called them on Monday and made an interview for Tuesday. And Wednesday, they had me doing a fill-in show. Um, and I'd done part-time with them, which was a struggle for a good seven months. About two months ago, they made me full-time and, and gave me this position that I, that I now have. Yeah. But I'd much rather be here. I, I, like I said, I, I feel that I can make more of a contribution as a radio personality here. Uh, I mean, I, I could be on the air in the States full time somewhere, but I, I feel like I'd just be spinning records. Here I can, I can make a difference. The people in the USA uh, who know uh, you were on an offshore radio station, uh, don't they say this, this guy is crazy? Uh, they're fascinated by it. it is thoroughly fascinated, uh, um, you know, because I tell them these stories as to, you know, how big a star I was, and uh, that amazes them at times, and actually sometimes I think they don't fully understand, I think they, they think I'm just on an ego trip and trying to sound important, and, uh, you know, I say, no, 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 I had 10 million listeners, and uh, I had this happen and that happen, and they're just starting to see how, how big it really was. Um, some have heard about it, and uh, they find it fascinating. Matter of fact, I met a man just three weeks ago who's very big in radio and broadcasting, and um, our station has been sold to another company, and he's consulting on the sale. Oh, he happens to be Gary Stevens, who was on... Radio England. Right, right, Radio England. And uh, he had seen the poster. I've got one of the posters of the ship up in the control room. And as he was going through checking the place out, he saw that and said, oh, where did you get that? And they said, oh, Charlie Wolf." So he comes walking into the general manager's office where I was sitting and said, here you are on laser. And next thing you know, I'm talking to one of the most important men in broadcasting and getting, very, you know, getting to know the man. So uh, it's a small world. You, you do meet people that were involved or at least know of it.
What was the, the, the finest moment uh, in your laser period? Hard to say. <laughs> yeah, no. What, uh, <laughs> um, laser was the, the, the best and worst time of my life. Um, because it was off the air, there was a lot of problems, it was not easy. Um, I think, um, I think the best time was just overall in the fact that I finally discovered me. You know, in, in radio, what separates the, the pros, as it were, from the, those that aren't, is the pros don't sound like disc jockeys. And for years, I was trying to be a disc jockey and trying to put on the DJ voice. And I wasn't being me, and Laser got let me attain that. And uh, I mean, you have these you have these fond memories of, of say your your top ten bits. Um, Euro Siege would go into that. B Babe was I think a personal favorite. Um, the day I went on the back of the ship and and tried to communicate to the Dioptric and started screaming at them. Um, the heroin announcement was was a favorite bit. Uh, you know, you just, you just, it's hard to single out any one, but you think back to these, these little adventures and you go, wow, I can't believe I came up with chipping Sodbury sound, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, I don't know, first summer was also very nice. Um, the going, the, you know, summertime and the living is easy. Uh, we had many parties. We were going over to, uh, to the Ross Revenge and visiting Caroline and Monique. Uh, actually, no, Monique, I don't think Monique was around at that point, was it? Uh, no. No, first summer it was, it was just, it was just, you know, the raw, but being able to go over and, and visit those guys, and they came over, and we had some parties, whoo-hoo, um, but, you know, tons of memories, tons of them. You heard later that uh, this 1st of April Fool was not the first one. I, I, I mean, Oh, oh, yes. Uh, in other words, what, what uh, Johnny Walker was doing. Uh, Not only Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker was on, on Lady Women. Uh, no. Woman. Right. Um, I mean, hearing the history of it has been fascinating. Uh, you know, I've met a lot of people from the old days. Uh, I met Dick Palmer. I've met uh, Dick Dixon. Um, who else is there? Johnny Walker. I mean, Johnny is just, I don't think I know a finer, finer gentleman. You know, he really is, is, is just one of the nicest people I know. Uh, I didn't get a chance last night when I was at LBC to, to talk with Keith Skews, but to listen to them reminiscing, mm -hmm. you know, you feel like, yeah, what if all I've done is I've copied the originals. You know, they, they were my own ideas, but, but boy, I was going, oh, it's all been done before and uh, probably better. <laughs> But for the people who are listening nowadays, you are a big star. I saw uh, Paul today that you was uh, you were number one on the list of the Osho DJs. Mm -hmm. And um, well, it's a two-way street. I mean, I can't take all the credit. Um, if it wasn't for the audience being there and appreciating me, that that gave me the inspiration to want to do better. Uh, so it's developing that that two-way communication between the disc jockey and the audience that helps, you know, make made me what I was. I mean, all I was was, I was me. Nothing more. Was there coming in many posts uh, on the communicator and how many weeks took it before it was on the ship? Uh, Tom, I'm sorry. The letters from the audience. Oh. Um, it would generally take, oh dear, a month, two months, because Letters had to go from England or Holland or wherever to New York, which can take easily two weeks. And then it could take forever for uh, First Media, or not First, that's where I work now, <laughs> for Music Media International to take it and send it back. And then it would take, I don't know how long to get it to our tender people. And then that could sit in their office for, I don't know how many weeks. Uh, until they could bring it out. Uh, so it made it tough because you know, you'd, you'd have people writing about going, gee, Charlie, that, uh, that bit you did was the funniest thing I've ever heard. This is something you did three months ago and you've since stopped doing. And now you're going, oh, now I find out it was funny. You know, and you're trying to resurrect an old bit that you thought wasn't working. So it, 
it made it tough, but but we lived for the mail. I mean, we really did. Uh, that was, you know, that was my communication. Like I said, it's a two-way communication, so I knew what the what the people were thinking. Most of the listeners, uh, or the anoraks, let us say it in that way, most of the anoraks uh, who uh, listen to your programs and you had this little laugh in it, most of them think it's your own laugh, but it isn't. No, well, actually, I think there was one laugh in there that was me, but uh, I'd use a lot of sound effects packages. Um, sometimes it was just me live. I mean, I'd, I'd laugh, I'd cry. It was, you know, it was... I mean, people always thought that I was just such a zany guy. But I wasn't always zany. I mean, I was, I was, like I said, I was me. There were nights when, I did. I think I cried once or twice on the air. I was just so moved to do so, and I did it. And uh, you know, I felt like I was talking to my best friends. And when you talk to your best friends, I mean, you know, you and I are friends, and I don't go up to you and say, "Hans, baby, how are you?" You know, that's 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 fake, right? Uh, so I tried to talk to everyone, as if you know, whether I knew them or not, as my best friend. You know the same laugh from the LA Fort albums uh, is now used on Kill, right? Yes. Oh yeah, they're, 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 it's it's popular sound effects, and we use them in the states. Um, I'm trying to actually get away from using them now because I know everyone else does, and it's it's a little bit tougher. But you have to come up with your own stuff now, and uh, you know eventually, if I come back, you may not hear some of the old sound effects because everyone else uses them. Also, not the Disney thing. Oh, that I'll yeah, because. Who else can use that, though? <laughs> That's, who's afraid of the big... I actually heard a version done by Barbara Streisand. Yeah, it's on her first album, and um, I, may, uh, I may make a little jingle out of that someday. You know, but uh, yeah, I don't expect there's going to be too many people using Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf. That's, that's me. <laughs> We see you now very happy again uh, in England. So, what about the future for you? Well, I'm still trying to get back. I feel this is where I'm meant to be. I'm, I'm, my friends think I'm crazy. I spoke with uh, a number of people. Steve Wright at Radio One, the BBC, the first thing he says to me is, Charlie, you could go back. He says, you could, you could kick Rick D's. Why aren't you in the States? Why do you want to come here? But the thing is, I love this country. I'm, I'm established here. Um, you know, and also in Holland, I mean, not, you know, and I, I'd, I'd love to get over there a little bit as well. Uh, I mean, I'm established in this part of the world. It's good to know I can call up a program controller and it's like, oh, Charlie Wolf, well, I'd love to hear what you have to say, because, you know, in the States it's Charlie who? I don't have time, sorry. Um, but at this point, obviously, you're dealing with international politics. It's a very hard thing to deal with, even if you were doing something like just coming over to be a stockbroker. But radio is a tough thing to, to deal with to get over here. And then to have been working for Laser, well, you know, obviously I have my enemies um, without naming names. But, you know, there's people that uh, weren't all that happy with my presence here. I mean, I stirred some stuff up. So it's it's been a long, long, arduous process. Uh, but you have my assurance that I have not given up and if it takes me five years or fifty years I I don't plan on giving up you know this this is where I'm supposed to be and I I haven't felt permanent in the United States I mean I I've got stuff in in England that I have not moved back to the to the States because this is where I'm meant to be this is where I want to be yeah if Lazy would go back and they would uh, allow you for a big amount of money to come back on the ship. Would you do that? <sighs> In my heart, yes. But um, quite frankly, no. For a couple reasons. One, I've done laser. And I don't want people to think of Charlie Wolf as just a laser has been. I mean, he's always on laser. Um, <coughs> if you like if Michael Jackson kept on singing Thriller and never wrote something new and never took new chances. Also, I feel at this stage, I'll do better in the system than I will from outside the system. If I should go back to laser, I'll never get in the system. You know, so I've, I've got to play politics. I've got to play their game. 
So um, at this stage, no, I don't see a return to the high seas. It's you know, it's, it's it'll always be in my heart and it'll be my fondest memories, but it's it's just not feasible. So maybe if you get a walking permission, uh, it'll be Radio One or something. Oh, I hope. <laughs> you know, it'll be all over. I mean, the the, the sky's the limit. And I and I also want to get into other things behind the scenes. Uh, I'd like to. Once the green paper goes through and new radio stations come on, I'd, I'd love to get into uh, consulting and working with disc jockeys over here. I don't see. I don't want one of, one of the problems they have is they hear someone good, be it me or Steve Wright or, or whomever, and everyone copies those jocks. I don't want a hundred Charlie Wolves in this country because because you're never going to be Charlie Wolf, just as I'm not going to be you. So I'd love to sit down and, and give my experience and my expertise and teach people how to be themselves you know, and make for better broadcasters in this country. So let's cross her fingers and hope you will be back very soon. Let's pray. And uh, yeah, you haven't seen the last of me. I will be back. Okay, thank you and have a good way back to USA. And then we're back again here. Thanks, Hans. Laser 558, where the hits keep coming. From the MV Communicator in International Waters, we are Laser 558, owned by URAD SA. This is free radio with non-stop hit music, practicing good programming and technical standards. Telephone company. Operator, I've just got to tell everybody about Laser 558, Europe's newest radio station. I need the phone books for all of Northwest Europe. They are issued free of charge to our subscribers. Simply flag down any repair truck and they'll throw one to you. Okay, and I've got to get a phone in my home so I can tell everybody about Laser 558. The vantage point on the poop deck of the MV Communicator. Daily reports. Very exciting day. Uh, we actually got a glimpse of some of the guys from the... Uh, the In-depth background the features. The optic surveyor. It's not an ocean-going vessel. And all of our fast news-gathering resources. Euro Siege update. 